coming on the clouds Kings and kingdoms will bow Just one, right? Just one shun. It's not Revelations. It's the last book in your Bible. And we, wow, we have a lot going on in the chapter that we're in today. It's chapter 12. Lots going on. And as we get into this, it's going to be dealing with, and we're going to be looking at particularly this chapter in regards to spiritual warfare. So something happens when you become a Christian and a lot of times we don't even realize what's happening or why it's happening. But as we become a Christian, then we become enemies of Satan. This brings about certain things that can happen called spiritual attacks, weird things that happen, hard things, difficult things. And it's important for us to know how to deal with spiritual warfare. In fact, it's, 
It's critical, vital. If you're a Christian, we have to know how to deal with spiritual warfare. So this morning, we're going to look at the sort of the, the roots of spiritual warfare. We're going to look at how to be effective in overcoming spiritual warfare. And we're going to look at specifically what's being targeted and who's being targeted in spiritual warfare. So if you have your Bibles, get ready. Hold on to your hats. A lot going on here. We better pray one more time, right? Lord, I just ask that you would again reveal these truths to our heart and help us to be doers of your word. And I pray that we would engage you now, Lord, with all of our being. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so Revelation chapter 12, we've been working our way through the book. We've seen all kinds of stuff going on, but the key is we've seen how the Lord in a seven-year period that's going to come onto the earth called the tribulation, we see how God is using this time, which is still yet future, to bring back primarily the nation of Israel to himself and also to bring as many as would hear the voice of, of his call to repent and turn to Jesus Christ. Seven year period is a time in which the church will be removed prior to this seven year period, caught up, snatched up in a twinkling of an eye. The church will be raptured into heaven, spending that seven year period with Jesus and then the church will come back with Jesus at the end of the seven year period. So we're kind of dropping in here now and taking a look at what's going on. We've seen these judgments are being poured out in certain ways. One, seven seal judgments, right? So there's a scroll and that scroll had seven seals on it. Those seals were open. Each one of those seals was a judgment coming on the earth. The seventh seal contained in it what? Seven trumpets over there. The seven trumpet judgments. So now we have a whole nother set of judgments called trumpet judgments. That's what we're in now. We're looking at that and we're up close to getting into the seven, the last seven set of judgments, which are called seven bold judgments. But right now we're kind of getting a little more information of what's going on in the tribulation period. Last week we looked at the two witnesses and we took a look at that. This week we're looking at all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on. So let's just dive right into it. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a garland of 12 stars. So the question is now, John is getting a revelation from heaven. He's seeing this. And we're to try to understand who the woman is. Well, we're very fortunate because the Bible gives us the answers to these things. And that's why the book of Revelation, it's not a difficult book to understand, right? The reason sometimes we think it's difficult is because the book of Revelation grabs over 400 allusions or references to the Old Testament. Well, here we're given a, a picture of a woman. And it, the woman is described with, uh, with the moon and the sun and the 12 stars. Well, if we reach back to the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verse 9, the story of Joseph... It says this, Joseph dreamed still another dream and he told it to his brothers and he said, look, I have dreamed another dream and this time the sun, the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Same description that we get in the book of Revelation. What's he talking about? Well, his brothers were very upset because he was the youngest brother and they knew what he was talking about. His older brother said, oh, so we're all going to bow down to you? 
And then even his parents said the same thing. His parents, Jacob and Rachel, said, so, Yo, so we're going to all bow down to you. Well, if you follow the story, that's what happened, right? So here we have the, the formation in the very beginning of the nation of Israel through the 12 tribes, which were the 12 offspring of Joseph. So number one, we're introduced here to Israel. So remember what we're talking about, context. So we're looking at the origin right now of spiritual warfare. Is Israel a big factor when we're talking about spiritual warfare? Do you have to talk about Israel? Is there a more persecuted group in the world than Israel? No. Has there ever been a time where Israel hasn't been persecuted? No. So here we have the introduction of a woman, but if, if you're still not clear of that, we get a little more information. Look what he says next in verse 2. It says, This woman, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems or crowns on his head. Heads. And then it says his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. Okay, so now we're introduced to a couple new characters here. So we have the woman, which I'm making the case that it's Israel. And this woman, it says she's crying out, like crying out to give birth. And that reference there, crying out to give birth, it says she's, she was with child and she cried out in labor pain to give birth. So we're going to see as this develops, this is Jesus. The child is Jesus. So we have Israel which gave birth to the Messiah. Israel has been crying out with child before Jesus was born. Israel was looking for their Messiah. They were crying out for their Messiah. The prophets would come and talk about a Messiah who had come to restore all things. And so that's this uh, nation of Israel and their longing and the desire that they had for their Savior to come. Now, we have the introduction then of another character, and, and this character is called the fiery dragon. So this is referring to Satan himself. And we get this information here of Satan himself, and it says that his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. So this is going all the way back, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, gives us the story of the fall of Satan. We're going to look at that a little more in a second, but here's what's going on. So the description of Satan is described as a red fiery dragon. This speaks of his violent tendencies to steal, rob, and destroy. And this, this goes all the way back before Genesis chapter 1. It goes back before the Garden of Eden. Satan fell before the Garden of Eden. So when Satan fell then, and God created man, going back to Genesis, now Satan was targeting men and women, people, people on the earth. Satan began his scheme or his plan to get rid of the seed of a woman. You follow that? This is important because Satan, this anointed cherub, this beautiful angel, this one that was so much more wonderful than all the other angels, he got to a place where he wanted to be worshipped like God. 
And this was his downfall. This is where Satan fell. And he was cast down. And with him, he took a third of the angels in heaven. So two thirds didn't fall. But we're talking about, the Bible describes as far as angels go, myriads upon myriads. So a third of myriads upon myriads, that's, that's a lot. I don't know how much that is, but that's a lot. So Satan, with these fallen angels, began to attack the human race in Genesis chapter 3. The reason he did that was because he wanted to prevent redemption and restoration. So man was created in the image of God. Satan immediately went about to tempt man to sin. Genesis 3. And we know the story of Adam and Eve. And man sinned. Sin entered into the world. And now God began his plan to restore, Genesis 3.15, to restore mankind through the seed of a woman, it says. It's interesting, not to get too graphic, but women don't have seeds. And this is a reference to the immaculate conception of Jesus Christ, that he would be born without a human father so to speak that god the father was his fa father if that makes sense so it's in genesis 3:15 it says she, uh, that he would be born of the seed of a woman already in the beginning referring to how jesus would come into the world so now the purpose and the plan of satan the fallen cherub with his demons was he would work in society, in the world, so that the Messiah would not come. So all through the ages, we see this plan of Satan to infiltrate the human race. We see that in Genesis 6, where the daughters of men and the uh, evil um, demons would attempt to have sexual relationships with women to create a race of giants. I know it sounds crazy. Read Genesis 6. So it would pollute the human race so that the Messiah couldn't come. We've seen that if you read through your Old Testament, the plan and purpose of many of evil people and societies to try to eradicate the, the Jewish race, the nation of Israel. We think of Haman with Esther, that whole thing. Even with uh, Herod, when Jesus came, he was said to kill all the babies in Bethlehem under the age of two. That's, what, that's where this is all coming from. So let's just take a little, little bit more here. And then we'll have a little bit of a discussion about that. So in verse 4, the tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. This is the fall of Satan. And the dragon, Satan, stood before the woman, Israel, who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's exactly what happened when Jesus was born. Verse 5, she bore a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So now what this, speak, this is speaking of is Jesus reclaiming the earth for himself, which in the book of Revelation, that's exactly what he's doing right here, right? So he's in the process of reclaiming the earth for himself. And we're going to see that process come to its final place where Jesus rules and reigns in righteousness when? After the seven year tribulation period in a time called the millennial kingdom. What's that? That's the thousand year rule and reign of Jesus on the earth. Where is Satan? Satan is bound. His demons are bound. Why are they bound? Because they will be let out after the thousand years so that those who 
in the millennial kingdom who were born and never had an opportunity to decide if they're going to go with God or reject God. Well, they'll be let out at that time, the end of the thousand year reign, and many will go after Satan at that time as well. So be that as it may. Watch what's happening here again. Verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. So this is speaking of Jesus' ascension, right? So Jesus was born of a woman, Mary. Jesus lived his life out 33 years. During that time, he was fulfilling the law for man, doing what we couldn't do so that he can take our place in punishment. This is the gospel. So Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, rose again on the third day, and then he spent some time circulating around, talking to and, and ministering to over 500 people. And then what did he do? He was caught up. He ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God until the day where he sits on the throne of David. And that's where he'll be ruling and reigning in righteousness. Hopefully you guys are good here. <laughs> I told you there's a lot going on. So... Verse 6, so now he says, the woman fled into the wilderness. So now there's a big gap between Jesus being caught up in heaven and what's being spoken of here. The woman fled to the wilderness. This is during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. So the tribulation is seven years, and it's often divided by two, three and a half year periods. This is speaking of, that last three and a half years where everything gets really intense, if you've read through the book of uh, Matthew chapter 24, it talks about how if you're, it's not a good time to be pregnant during that time. It talks about as soon as you see the abomination of desolation, which is the Antichrist in the temple defiling it, they're told to get out of there. Don't like wait to... Have your load of wash finished. Don't wait for your falafel to finish cooking. As soon as that happens, go into the wilderness. Get out of there. And the reason is because of what's being spoken of here in verse 6. And if you want to have a little good homework tonight, read chapter 24 of the book of Matthew. So the woman fled to the wilderness, probably the Judean wilderness. And... This is to escape a ferocious, pointed attack of Satan to specifically the nation of Israel. And then it says, they're to escape to the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Huh. So somehow, during this tribulation period, it's going to be so important that you understand what's going on. And if you're a believer, you won't be here during that time. If you're not a believer, you need to really pay attention because you're going to need to know what to do. But better to get saved today than you don't have to deal with it. But be that as it may. So it's interesting. They're told to flee into the Judean um, wilderness so they can escape. But at the same time, we know we live in a time where there's like drones and satellites, and chips, and all this stuff. Like, how are people going to actually escape? There's a kind of a suggestion in the book of Isaiah where it says this. I'll just read it for you. It's Isaiah 16. And it says, Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah, which means rock, to the wilderness, unto the mount of the daughter of Zion, for it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as thy night, 
in the midst of the noonday, hide the outcasts, uh, be weary not him that wanders, let my outcast dwell with thee, Moab, be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner is at an end, and the spoiler stops, and the oppressors are consumed out of the land. What does that mean? Basically, there's a place in the Judean wilderness right now called Petra. Have you guys heard of that? Go look it up. Unfortunately, we, when we went to Israel last time, we didn't get to go there. But I really want to go there. But it's a rock city. It's, you can see pictures online. It's a, a whole city made out of rocks. Very hard to get in with large numbers of people because there's just a narrow gate entrance in there. It could be, and a lot of people think that this is the place where the Jews are going to, many are going to flee out in that area to find protection from these vicious attacks of Satan. But notice here at the end of verse 6, it says, They should feed her, Israel, there 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. So here, here's the thing. Number one, point number one. I know it's a lot of information. That's okay. The root then of all the problems and trouble in the whole world all comes back to this one person, Satan, who was a fallen angel and that fallen angel corrupted the human race through sin. And God then set forth to bring about his son to redeem the fallen world. And Satan ever since has been on attack to attack Israel, to attack God's people, to ruin the plan of God to redeem and to set up his redeemed world in the millennial kingdom. So number one, what can we draw from that? We have to first understand that there is a real spiritual battle going on. And we experience it. If you're a Christian, you feel it. If you're not a Christian, you see it. And Satan is working in so many different ways from so many different angles to get us as a Christian, as Christians, to be ineffective in our walk with God. So that's what he does. So Satan can't take our salvation he works overtime so we don't get saved. But once we're saved, he then works overtime so we become ineffective in the things that God has for us. So that's why as Christians, that's why sometimes it's hard. And that's why sometimes you don't want to read your Bible. Sometimes you don't want to pray. Sometimes you feel like quitting and sometimes you, you feel like walking away from the Lord. Sometimes... You just get to a place where you, you don't care anymore. And this is why. It's because you're being attacked. And Satan is working so that you will stop. Why? Because if you're a Christian, you have the power of God in you to bring forth spiritual fruit, one, in the way of other people being saved, and two, that you would walk in the power and the strength of God. And if we start to think that this is no big deal, and we don't apply our spiritual weapons of warfare, if we have a low or minimal view of prayer, if we have a low or minimal view of the Word of God, then we are setting ourselves up for failure because Satan is ever on the attack to bring us into submission 
Or in other words, nothingness, spiritual nothingness. That's what he wants to do. So first, right off the bat, we have to make a decision <coughs> to walk in the power of God to be vigilant, sober-minded, what does that mean? That we have to be aware of what's going on. If you're a Christian, you know life is not just about here and now. And you know life is not just about ourselves. But behind the veil is a raging war for souls. And God has enlisted us as mighty warriors of God to engage in spiritual warfare. And that's why our next point is so important. How do we actually overcome? How do we become people that are not just stuck in our Christian life? How do we become people that are on fire, that are fruitful, that are passionate and effective as Christians? Look what he says in verse 7. So now he says a war broke out in heaven. And Michael and his angels, they fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So now in verse 7, now we have this, this raging war going on in heaven. And notice it's not a war of God directly fighting Satan. Why is that? You ever see those like cartoons where... There's like the devil on one shoulder and then like a, you know, Jesus or a good person on the other. And they're going back and forth. God has no equal. God doesn't have a counterpart. God doesn't have um, somebody that, that is uh, opposite of him. He, he, God is God. He's, he's the creator. All else is the creation. It's more appropriate in war spiritual warfare to think about Michael and Satan, two angels. Satan's a fallen angel. God is above all that in control, ruling and reigning in righteousness. So the angel, Michael the archangel, he's fighting. There's a war in heaven breaking out. Look at verse 8. But they did not prevail, nor was their place found for them in heaven any longer. Look at this in verse 9. So the great dragon, who's that? Satan. Satan was cast out. The serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So that's referring to that dragon in the tail and the third cast out. So now we get this Picture that in heaven, this war is going on. This is interesting. Did you know that Satan actually has access to, this, to heaven? The book of Job, chapter 1, tells us that Satan is going to and fro all the earth looking for a victim, looking for somebody to attack. But then he, then he had this discussion with God himself. And God himself said, Is, have you considered my servant Job? But in, in heaven, so Satan has access into heaven, but he doesn't have any ability to do anything. But it, he has these discussions with God, it appears. But at, at this point, in the tribulation, now Satan is cast out of heaven. He doesn't have any, he, any access anymore. And he's cast into the earth. So now all he has is the earth at this point. That's the only place he has to roam around. So in verse 10, it says, Then he heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of, God, of our God and power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren 
who accuse them before our God day and night has been cast down. Okay, this is really important. So what is Satan doing in heaven? Satan is in heaven saying to God day and night. Did you see what John did? Do you know how terrible John is? Do you know John has no business doing what he's doing? Do you know you should cast John into heaven forever, or hell forever? Do you know John is a horrible, wicked, despicable person? He's saying that to God 24-7. Day and night. And he's doing it to all you too. Why? Because by his very name, he's an accuser of the brethren. So you know what? He doesn't just do that to God. He does that to you. Do you know he's saying those same things to your mind constantly? Do you know that's how Satan works? He works by constantly speaking to you things that are not of the truth. Especially constantly telling you things of accusation. Things of that... that are saying that you're horrible and terrible and all these things. And he does that and he's standing there. And he doesn't take a break. And that's why we, we can have a, a hard time if we don't learn. If we don't learn how to bat, battle these things. And so what he does is he tempts us and speak to, speaks to us, accuses us about our badness. And then you know what we do if we listen? We start to say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm a bad person. I evolved from an ape and I've become this thing and nothing matters. And so I begin to act like an ape. I begin to monkey around. I go bananas <laughs> because I don't realize and I don't know I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But see, guys, here's what's so important. It's so important, the Bible says, to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we have to learn that our minds cannot be permitted to be a cesspool of satanic activity. Our minds need to be a garden of fruitful thoughts of God and applying the things of God in our meditation life, we have to be very good at catching those thoughts that are not of the Lord. Thoughts of doubt, despair, worry, and anxiety. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. But Satan will keep, keep whispering, speaking, tempting us with the point of getting us into a place where now we're walking in the flesh instead of walking in the Spirit. But watch this. In verse 10, they overcame, they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Three things. This is how we win the spiritual battle. We have to recognize we're in it first. And we have to be those who engage God. Spiritual warfare is one of the best ways for us to be on fire for the Lord. Because we start getting attacked... It makes us want to go to Jesus and pray desperately for him. And when we do that, we're turning Satan's plan on his head. And I believe that's what Paul meant in Romans where he says we're more than conquerors. We're not just conquering in that we're being successful in not succumbing to the temptations of the enemy. But we're actually, God uses the temptation of the enemy against him back we're more than conquerors so to the christian to 
those who take these things seriously, to those who want to be used by God, to those who want to uh, experience the power of God and effectiveness in their life, there's three things that he says. Number one, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. What is that? Number one, it's the gospel. What's the gospel? Well, you know, if you're a Christian and you... You're a Christian because of the gospel. You heard the gospel. You heard what Jesus did. And you heard that you can put your faith in Jesus Christ and give your life to Him. And by that, the chains have been broken to sin and darkness. You're no, no longer in bondage to those things. And now you're a new creation in Christ. All things have been passed away, all things have been made new, and now you can walk in the newness of life. Amen. But here's what happens. A lot of times if we're saved, we can have the temptation to revert back into unsaved ways to live out our Christian life. The gospel is not just effective for our salvation. The gospel is effective for our walks, a powerful walk. Well, what do you mean? Well, the gospel is then, and, and he, he says the blood of the lamb. They overcome by the blood of the lamb. And that means that we're living a gospel-centered life. That means that we're living a life by faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have been crucified with Christ. How are we crucified with Christ? None of us have actually literally been crucified, but we've spiritually been crucified by our faith in what He did. It's called the substitutionary death. So our faith substitutes His death for our death. Our punishment, which we should have had, for his punishment. So by faith, we've been crucified with Christ. And so if we're crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live anymore, but now it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith. So the gospel is then the fact that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He's broken the chains that I've had, my linkage to sin. Why? So I can go back and sin again? No. So I can live for God. Amen. I can live in the light and the joy and the glory of His goodness. So we walk in the fullness of the Spirit. That's what it means. So we don't become a Christian and then start living by all these rules. We live by the Spirit working in us and through us. It's the blood of the Lamb. And the blood of the Lamb has made us white as snow. It's turned our sins that were scarlet to white as snow. And so now there's a power in our life, a power greater than us that we walk in. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And now the, the book isn't something that's outside of us that we try to live our life and measure things up by the book. The book comes and transforms us inside of us so we are the book. The book is then transforming. We're becoming more like Christ. We're becoming more like what He's intended us to be and so that's what it means that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So the Gospel, number two, He says, and by the word of their testimony. What was the word of, the test of their testimony? It was that they were saved by the grace of God. Number two, if you're going to overcome, it's not just the gospel, it's the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is that? It's what He has done for us. Satan comes and accuses you. You're terrible, you're horrible, you're awful. Everybody thinks you're terrible, horrible, and awful. But by the grace of God. I'm all that, but by the grace of God. It's not by my works or my goodness, but I relinquish 
to the one who is perfect. So I'm perfect in him. It's by grace. It's not by works. And so when the accuser comes and I can fall on the grace of God, it's not a standard. It's not a measuring who's gooder or who's badder. It's all by the blood of Jesus Christ that we have fallen before his face in worship and adoration because it's all by his grace. So nobody has anything they can boast about. We don't have any right to scrutinize one another and say, I'm a little bit better than you. That person's really not measuring up. Hey, it's all by the grace of God. So we stand in the gospel, the finished work of Jesus Christ. We apply the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as we live. We don't fall into the standard of measurements, but we say it's all by the grace of the Lord. And then look at the last thing. They did not love their lives to death. They did not love their lives to death. I'm going to finish with this. The third thing is to overcome. It's not just the gospel or I'm sorry, it's the gospel and it's grace, but then it's also giving up. They didn't love their lives to death. And here's the thing. This is what I really want to end on and focus on. You see, sometimes as Christians, we can, we can kind of live our Christian life out sort of like the children of Israel when they didn't go into the promised land, but they're going around in circles for 40 years. And that, that was their whole existence until they died. How sad would that be to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> given spiritual gifts, and yet live your life out as a wilderness Christian, dusty, stinky, and just wanting to die? See, they didn't go in because they didn't have faith. The promised land is a picture of abundance, power, but also warfare too, right? They went and took territory from the enemy. So here's the thing. In the book of Luke, Jesus explains to us what it really means to be living powerfully for Jesus Christ. What it really means to be a successful or effective Christian. And here's what he said. I'll read it for you. Luke 9, 23. Jesus said to them, if anyone desires to come after me. So that's really a good first question, isn't it? I'd just like to pause there and ask yourself that question. Do you really want to come after Jesus? He leaves it wide open. He said, if anyone wants to come after me, so I think that that's a, a, an important thing to really consider. Like, how do we see our, our Christianity being played out? Do we see it being played out as, as one where Jesus is just kind of a, an addition to our already planned out life? We're just kind of, we want Jesus to join in our plans. Jesus says something there that's very interesting. I think it's so critical for us to understand. If anyone, if anyone wants to come after me, how bad do you want to come after Jesus? If you do, he says this. Number one, let him deny himself. Number two, take up his cross daily. And number three, follow me. And then he kind of explains it. He says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and the holy angels. So check this out. Jesus himself, he's saying, We're not going to get 
to the place of power and fulfillment and all that's meant to be in the Christian life until we do first, we deny ourselves. So what does that mean? That means the Christian first has to have a mindset or an attitude that we will prioritize Jesus and living for His will above all else. It's not a 50-50 deal or 60-40, 80-20. It's a 100% relinquishing of ourselves to God. And sadly, many Christians never even get to that place. Jesus just becomes some sort of uh, iconic figure in their life that they may go to in times of desperation or need. But the Christian life, when we first give our life to Jesus Christ, our walk then has to be to where it's, it's just Jesus. Above all else, we want Him and His will. And until then, we haven't even got out of the starting gate. So he says, deny yourself. The, the second thing, he says, take up your cross and follow me. See, what happens is when you and I prioritize Jesus and we say, Jesus, I just want to live for your will. The second thing that happens is we take up our cross. That means we will start to experience the pain of denying ourself. Did you know it hurts to deny yourself? You know it hurts to live for God's will? Why does it hurt? Because our flesh is being crucified practically. So if we're saved, our, our flesh has been mortified or killed, but then practically living it out, what happens is now it, it hurts. It hurts not to get our way or to have our plans rearranged but see how many people stop there where they say Lord I want you so bad I want you to be the first place in my life your will be done and then as soon as things start to go a different way or get hard we give up and you know what happens we never get to that third part is follow me Following me, that's the place where the Christian finds the most amazing intimacy and fellowship with the Lord that makes denying self and makes taking up the cross so acceptable because the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're experiencing practically. The following part of Jesus is walking in intimacy with Him in power and glory and fruitfulness and abundance and satisfaction. And this is the place where we're tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. And now we don't want anything else because the Lord is so good. And so we... We deny ourselves and we say, Lord, I just, I just want you. Your will be done. And then we, we go through whatever process, whatever, Lord, you do in my life that, that I praise you. You give and take away. I don't care. Whatever it is, I just want to follow you. And when we're following him, there's nothing better. It's heaven on earth. And sad to say, many Christians never get there and never walk that way. And we will never get to that place of abundance and fullness and power until we can deny ourselves and accept whatever may come our way because the Lord is working out His plan, which is different than our plan, because His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we are the clay. He is the potter. We succumb to Him, submit to Him, walk with Him in obedience. And we get to the place that God intends us to be, and that's the fullness of a life with Jesus Christ. Amen. There's nothing better than that. So, you guys okay? That's, that's a lot in there. So, we didn't even finish, but...
We're finished for today.